this week, an excellent interview with one of the latest Blue Friars, Brother Adam Kendall. In this interview, we talk about all manner of things, including how to really get started in becoming a great writer. How do we get started? We'll talk about the Plumb Line, the Scottish Rite Research Society, getting involved with Grand Lodge, and all manner of things. Stay tuned for this candid interview with Worshipful Brother Adam Kendall. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 586. As you heard on the top of the show, we've got a great one lined up for you with an awesome extended interview with our good friend and brother, Adam Kendall. But first, I want to thank our producers, fellows, contributors, and legacy partners of the show. Those of you who financially support this program make it possible that we can release Masonic education, interviews, and all kinds of great things of interest to Masons and those interested in the Royal Art every single week. If you're interested in how you can assist the WCY Podcast, head on over to wcypodcast.com, click on support the show, and check out the various options. Additionally, we also have a shop and a bookstore with Amazon affiliate links. In the news, we've got a couple things coming up. We've got uh, our presentation schedule is finally awake. (laughs) I've had to uh, get in there as I had to put in all of the dates that we've been booked for the year so far. Uh, Lots of things coming up. Notably, things I'm very much passionate about and very excited for is on April 15th, a free event for anyone, even open to the public. The Illinois Lodge of Research's Traveling Symposium, the brainchild of worshipful brother James E. Fry, who is a uh, past contributor to the Midnight Freemasons and Emeritus, if you will, is the senior warden of the Illinois Lodge of Research under the leadership of our esteemed brother, David Truax. And the Illinois Lodge of Research is going to be doing a traveling symposium. So on April 15th, 2023, we are going to host an event at the historic Valley of Danville, Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite. Now, there's a few things that are happening this day in Illinois Masonry. I understand some brothers will not be able to make it because of commitments to the uh, Valley of Chicago, perhaps, who I know will be doing part of our reunion. However, if you are not going to the Valley of Chicago and you are considering uh, doing something Masonic that day, On a Saturday, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., consider heading to the Valley of Danville. Now, our presenters for the day are going to be Brother Darren A. Laners, the managing editor over at the Midnight Freemasons, who has a wonderful topic lined up, as well as Gregory J. Knott. He's going to also be giving us a wonderful presentation, and Greg is such a delight to be around as well. And then I'll be presenting as well. Now, Darren and I together are uh, not as fun as Greg or cool as Greg. We're more like the two goofballs in the corner. But uh, if you'd like to come out anyway, please uh, consider it. We are asking you to just register to come out. You don't have to pay anything. You can go to tinyurl.com slash traveling, I-L-O-R. The details are also on the presentation schedule for the WCY podcast website. The second event that I'm really excited about, of course, is the Midwest Conference of Masonic Education, or MCME. It's an all-day, multi-day event. Uh, This is an annual event with probably the second or third longest-running Masonic Education Conference in the United States. Of course, the first is going to be the Allied Masonic Degrees Masonic Week. That wrapped up in February. Those who came know it was a wonderful time. Uh, The Midwest Conference is a little bit different. This is a multi-day annual event with featured speakers, vendors, workshops for all Master Masons wheresoever dispersed who are interested in Masonic education and promoting it. There are tickets that you will have to buy, and in addition to that, uh, the hotel registration information is also there. It's going to be in Canton, Ohio. I'll be heading down there with my good friend, Right Worshipful Brother Spencer Hammon, as well as uh, illustrious brother Chad Lasik. And I know it's going to be an awesome time. We are heading down there to do some great work and uh, to collaborate with our educational chums from around the Midwest, but even farther, because 
uh, the Midwest Conference of Masonic Education is the last remaining regional Masonic Education Conference that is sponsored at a Grand Lodge level. That means Grand Lodge sanctioned and supported. And so one of the things that is going to eventually happen, I'm sure, is that uh, the Midwest Conference of Masonic Education is just going to become the U.S. Conference on Masonic Education at some point. Uh, That's just my prediction. I'm not giving anything away. I I don't know. Um, I do have to say I have a vested interest in the Midwest Conference of Masonic Education. I am a member, and I carry votes there. But I do want you all to know that, of course, I would not be interested in something if it were not uh, truly believed in by myself and countless others. So if you want to learn more about the Midwest Conference on Masonic Education, please visit mcme1949.org. That's mcme1949.org. Or if you want to learn even more about it, we got an interview with the president this year in a recent episode. If you want to listen to that, that's going to be episode 581, Masonic Education in 2023. That's the title. And now it's time for us to get into this super cool interview with Brother Adam Kendall. Let's check it out. All right, everybody, we're back this week, and I am lucky enough to have Brother Adam Kendall. Brother Adam Kendall is a really well-known Mason from the academic side and both doing presentations all over the United States and globally. Brother Adam has earned his master's in history from California State University, Los Angeles. He's a life member of Phi Alpha Theta. Brother Kendall is an executive director at the Oakland Scottish Rite Historical Foundation. And in terms of Blue Lodge Masonry, he's a past master of San Francisco's Phoenix Lodge, number 144. He's also a full member of Couture Coronati Lodge, 2076. Essentially, he is everywhere. He's recently been inducted into the very prestigious Blue Friars organization just, I think, in 2022. And it was quite an awesome presentation you gave that day. And for the people who don't know, congratulations on that. It's a very prestigious organization. In fact, we didn't even get a uh, Blue Friar installed for 2023. It just speaks to the level of commitment and quality of work that you've put forth. I just want to say thank you so much for making the time to come on the show and talk to us about all things masonry. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I've been listening to your podcast for some time and I've really been impressed at its evolution. Like a lot of the uh, podcasts I listen to or the documentaries I listen to. So it's a a real honor. I started getting back into podcasts because my uh, radio station I used to listen to during my commute was abruptly taken off the air. And so I I like to have stuff talking at me while I drive. So I have about (laughs) a half an hour, 40 minute drive every day uh, each way. So it really passes the time and I could ramp myself up for my Masonic journey every day when I come to work at the office here at the Oakland Scottish Rite Temple. Yeah. So that's the other thing that I think is really amazing is you work very much within the fraternity. You have lectured at the World Conference on Freemasonry and Fraternalism at the Grand Lodge, what we call National de France. You've gone to the International Conference on the History of Freemasonry over in Scotland. So you've been all over the place. And to give our listeners a little bit of a background on yourself, can you tell us about, number one, why you even came into Masonry, and then a little bit about your journey in Masonry? Sure. Well, I came into Masonry about 1994, and I'd been interested most of my life from several different sources. One was my father, who was not a Mason, but one of his best friend's fathers was, and so He had formed a very positive opinion about it, but my dad also was interested in all sorts of interesting ideas and mysticisms and whatnot. And I remember him bringing it up once when we were watching uh, that movie, uh, Murder by Decree with Christopher Plummer and James Mason. And it's about, uh, it's based off of Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution. So it's, uh, Plot is interesting, but uh, historically it's hogwash, but it, you know, it's essentially revolves around Jack the Ripper being part of a Masonic plot. But, you know, there's a whole sequence in there where Christopher Plummer as Sherlock Holmes is 
revealing the secrets of Freemasonry to uh, another Mason. I think I think the character was uh, Sir Charles Warren, who uh, was supposed to be, and uh, he's revealing the secrets of a master Mason and also of the thirty third degree, et cetera. And so it's all <laughs> uh, f- fantasy and phantasm. But my dad was like, oh, the Freemasons, I want to know their secrets. And I was always really interested because obviously, like many of us, we come across fraternal art. And also, uh, there's Masonic halls all around the United States and small towns, big towns, et cetera. And they're clearly marked. And you always wonder what's going on in there. And some are grand. Some are not so grand, but you the the windows are always shaded or blackened. And then fraternal art, because a lot of it stems from, or what we see comes from the 19th century, the 1800s, there's a peculiar uh, style to that. And it's just, it attracts you. And then you see older stuff and that even has more mystique. And so I, I was always fascinated, but more importantly, grew up interested in art and I drew and whatnot. And I loved the idea of Freemasonry as a as a as sort of aesthetic science and people who were artisans could use these tools not only in a physical sense but also in a in a philosophical one and dare I say maybe even a spiritual one and uh, being interested in history from ancient to modern and particularly ancient Egypt now I don't ascribe Freemasonry as uh, being so far back that the Egyptians were practicing a form of Freemasonry, but the idea of building that how urban civilization developed and this mystery around very human act, which was building, you know, building uh, structures to live, but more importantly, building structures to the deity that really impacted me. And the idea of art being sort of a sacred act, right? So that is it in a nutshell. I guess if you got me in person, we could talk more about it, but that that's just the basics. I find it very interesting. You know, one of the first movies that I ever watched that had this Masonic connection was also for me, Murder by Decree. <laughs> and I remember watching it going, holy cow, like this is, <laughs> he really does give away. It's not Exactly. Right. But in a strange modicum, he gives, you know, kind of some signs and things which are interesting in themselves. But here nor there, really cool movie. Like you said, total hogwash. I wanted to interrupt you actually when you said you don't believe in the Egyptian origins of masonry as in they practiced some form of what we do today. And I was going to say, of course you do, because obviously you don't. If, if, If anybody doesn't know, you were actually one of the lecturers. And you gave a paper on kind of this idea of Egyptomania uh, mm-hmm. in Freemasonry, which I got to check out later after I got the cliff notes from Scott, who went out to the conference and my buddy, Scott Duball, who was mm-hmm. actually just on the program before you for the previous week. And he had nothing but you know high praise to say about your work, obviously, but very cool. What got you going in terms of moving into, say, Grand Lodge and things of that nature? Was that them leaning on your expertise and seeing that you were somebody who could get things done? Or was it more of you just got voluntold? I'm just curious. Right. So let me back up slightly on the sure. on, Go ahead. Uh, cryptomania. Now, others have written on this and have done a much better job than me, but because I'm not an Egyptologist, it's just something I've always delved into as a a kid. But my interest in history and also particularly in Western history, how it's not necessarily that we should be asking if Freemasons existed in ancient Egypt and indeed the rest of the ancient world, but it's how modern people and i'm talking when i'm talking about modern era i'm talking about you know 18th century on people received these very strange highly advanced civilizations that were being unearthed at the dawn of you know the science of archaeology so we that's where the answers are is how we interpret these people and how we ascribe what they how they lived with our own experiences in life and i think that there's more to say about that than actually trying to find that uh origin point right so anyway that's in a nutshell but that leads me on to you know my interests in these things how we receive certain cultures how we express 
we live their lives through our own experiences and sort of wrap ourselves in their accoutrements and strange symbols, alphabetical symbols, et cetera, and what we believe they believed in, uh, you know, religion and spirituality. Uh, I grew up in the, in, you know, in the seventies. And so there was a lot of that, you know, what the dawn of the new age, quote unquote, the, the title, not an actual new age. I, I guess that would be a new age, a lot of self-help groups, et cetera, and cults and all of these things. And I grew up with in search of hosted by Leonard Nimoy. So my interest was one of the greatest shows ever. <laughs> exactly. I'm exactly. just saying, I know in the, I know in the lead up, you know, in the credits, it says this is based on conjecture, yada, 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 but right. it still was amazing. <laughs> exactly. And so I, <laughs> I know, I know that there's a lot of, there's an upsurge in interest or an uptick in interest in pop culture in Freemasonry. And boy, did I ever live it. I mean, when I was a child, it was my birthday. And that's when they found the victims of Jonestown, which greatly affected everybody here in the Bay Area, because a lot of the victims were from here. And so it brought it really close to home. But also, it was uh, when the word cult became extremely popular. And I've known people all my life that were involved in EST, and other self-help groups, and all of a sudden they're being labeled as cult members, which is grossly unfair. I mean, you have to uh, judge them all individually, right? So I grew up around a lot of new agey people growing up in and around the Bay Area and the Central Valley. So you grow up around a lot of that. So I was exposed to a lot of alternative religions, et cetera. And so this formed my, you know, this was my background. And so being interested in Freemasonry from a historical standpoint, and also, again, that backdrop of sacred art and geometry, I eventually got up the nerve to call the Grand Lodge of California, which I was delighted that it was in San Francisco and I was living there at the time. And so I, I called, you know, not knowing what to expect, but figured, you know, at least they could give me the name of a nearby lodge that I could go visit. And uh, I, it was answered by a very nice man. His name is uh, Joel Springer. He was the assistant grand secretary at the time. He's now sadly passed away, but the, the rest is history. We, we became friends and he introduced me to his lodge and I joined that lodge. And that was Paul Revere 462. It's since consolidated. It's now known as Phoenix 144. We consolidated with an old lodge named Oriental 144, uh, who's one of its uh, most famous members is the orator and Unitarian minister, Thomas Starr King. Not to say that Paul Revere Lodge didn't have a venerable history. Um, it was uh, started by Germans in San Francisco in 1917, and that was not a really good time to be a German. Really, and they wanted it to be a cosmopolitan lodge, which it sounds odd because San Francisco has always been known as cosmopolitan. But by that time in the 20th century, you know, I think that San Francisco it had already kind of kind of parceled itself out where you had different ethnic groups had settled in different parts of the city and they all kind of hung out with each other. They were trying to get back to a, a more cosmopolitan uh, nature. So our consolidation was, uh, was very successful and we changed our name to reflect this new lodge rising out of the ashes of it, not just two, but several others that we had kind of consolidated with over the years. And, but not only that, it's the, the bird of San Francisco, you know, because San Francisco has burned down several times. So it was a fitting symbol for, for the lodge. And we have men of all different walks of life, ethnicities, et cetera. And it's a very good lodge. Anyway, so I met Joel and that, that's, that's it. At one point I was at a dinner and. Well, there's a couple things. One, Joel introduced me to, at the time, was uh, the Grand Secretary, John Cooper, who went on to become Grand Master. Uh, John and I struck up a friendship, and he was, both him and Joel were very encouraging Masonic research and apparently found some promise in me. Not that they read into my soul or anything, but they knew my interests. And so they encouraged me to do more research, et cetera. And I didn't start out like gangbusters right away. I, I tried to learn my work. I went through the chairs, but also wanted to provide some sort of educational content to lodge meetings. Now, at the time, Paul Revere was meeting on Fridays, which you can only imagine what happens 
with a lodge meeting and a Friday night. So thankfully, when we consolidated, we moved to Thursday nights. But I digress. It's just a funny little story. But um, they encouraged me to seek out more light, as they say, and introduced me to Quater Coronati or a, a lodge, not necessarily where I went, of course, but I uh, they introduced me more importantly to Ars Quatur Coronatorum, which is the publication that's been you know in print since the 1886, I believe. I should know this, uh, and uh, and also the Scottish Rite Research Society, which was still in its nascent stage. You know it, that was around; it, it was in its fourth year. Uh, also, more importantly, well, not more importantly, but also to emphasize the Philolathy Society, which Joel went on to become president of. Through those men, I that we got to have visitors who we took to our lodge, which was from Quater Coronati. I met Yasha Barrisoner and others. And that was really a treat because it's not often that you get a QC member at your lodge. So that was the beginnings of my Masonic educational period. And I did do some Masonic education and it was tolerated, I think. You had some grumblies that said only five minutes, and we've all heard those. And I know this because I've listened to your podcast. We all have stories about that. You know, it's not new. For those of you who are younger Masons, don't worry about it. It's not that we've all heard it before. It's that it just exists, and that's what exists, right? So that, in a nutshell, is, again, my my story. And then eventually, I uh, they had an opening in the member services department at Grand Lodge. And it was doing foreign correspondence. So if you were transferring your membership from overseas or needed a certificate of good standing from not just overseas, but different states, because it may as well be a foreign country, you know, I handled a lot of that. And then eventually uh, I was asked, because everybody knew my interests, uh, I was asked if I would be willing to take care of the library and museum, which I said, yes. What is fascinating, and this is a lost history for for many people, including my lodge, is that the library museum, the Henry Coyle Library Museum at Grand Lodge, for many years was staffed by members of my lodge. First was Kevin Tuck, who was a young master mason. He since moved out of state, but and then and then Joel Springer took over, and then me. So three generations of Phoenix Masons were involved with the Henry Coyle Library Museum. And I took that very seriously, and I was very proud of that, because that is our legacy. So even though you had a few members that didn't like some of the education, it was part of our lifeblood. So I did that for 14 and a half years or so. Let me qualify. I, I was at Grand Lodge for 14 and a half years, and I did the Library and Museum for about 10 years. So here's the thing that, and, and I have mentioned this before, and actually, I think I called you when I figured this out, and you and I had been first acquainted, I think, at uh, the 2019 Southern California at the South Pasadena Masonic Lodge, Masonicon event. And no, before that, it was at Colorado, and that's when oh, I Oh, yes, met yes, yes, you're right. We were in Colorado, and uh, I moderated a discussion with you and Scott about the benefits and how to do research and, and these things. And right. then I, I got home, and I was going through my emails, and I typed in Kendall in a search. And all of a sudden, I had this email from Adam Kendall, and the date was January 24th, 2006, at 6.49 p.m. Pacific time, <laughs> where I, uh, I had a, a web inquiry to the Grand Lodge of California, and the, respl- the response came from Adam Kendall, Master 144 Member Service Representative Conservator, Henry Coyle Library of Freemasonry, Grand Lodge, FNAM, California. And I just remember, I was like, holy shit, this was the, (laughs) it was the coolest, like just weird full circle thing ever. You were my first Masonic contact and you gave me so much stuff to check out. You had this five, six, like a paragraph, like essay that you did. And then you gave me all these quotes and books and videos. And then at the end of it, you were like very responsible in that you said, uh, it's truly a difficult task to contextualize certain books, especially those regarding Freemasonry, which weave many facets under one subject. And you were very cool about the way you you presented this as like, hey, 
don't believe everything you read. Remember, context matters. And also, you know, it was just really cool. And uh, I had to, I have to let everybody know that that was just so neat. You know, this was 2006. You know, it's just, uh, it seems like a lifetime ago, but uh, just really cool. And that's a story that I always keep in my wallet. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and we've talked about that before. And it's uh, really fun to see something pop up like that out of your past when, I had just started working in in the in the library museum and curating it and or collections manager or whatever and finding my voice within it because it was such a huge it, it well it still is a wonderful collection and one you would expect a Grand Lodge of California to have. I mean, we're a really interesting state in that we absorbed everybody <laughs> during the gold rush period. So we have a lot of interesting items that have been passed down or given or donated, et cetera. And so it was just a really daunting task at first. And then I started, you know, pretty much you know, going there. Even in my free time, I was working on stuff just to find interesting items and really trying to interpret it, trying to get a feel of what was there. And you know, there were many, many items that were later to jump out at me and some that I never took advantage of to write on. And I always thought that, oh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll get to that. Of course, you never do. And I, I'm sure I could go back to it, but I'm no longer around them. And when I left um, the Bay Area for a short period down to Southern California, I got married down there and kind of rearranged my life. I was sort of I needed to go get married is what I what I needed to do. I lamented that I wasn't around that collection because it had nurtured me so much. You know, uh, these aren't just things, they're ideas. It's a, you know, libraries and museums, you know, libraries are museums of thought and the museums are certainly very much the same thing. They, they're, these might be artifacts that someone touched or kept in their possession, at, you know, but they carry stories and I ascribe a lot of what I, I guess I would consider a success is that they affected me. They transformed me. And that's that's the way when I use the word success, it's not because it has anything to do with notoriety or whatever. It has everything to do with how I was transformed by them, how I was able to see the past through them. And in fact, it's sort of a long story, but I'll make it short. Uh, I got so deep into this that I had this amazing dream that I'll never forget. You know, there you have those moments where you think I'll never forget that because it's so clever or deep, and then you can't really get the sense of it later on. But this was so amazing that I had discovered time travel in this dream, and it was through photographs. And I remember in the dream thinking, gosh, this has been in our faces the whole time. This method of, of transporting yourself through time has always been there for us. And I've discovered it. And I showed a friend in the dream. And it was just such a wild trip. And I had a vision of a, of a place outside of a window. And I, try, I, I could see a street sign. And I could see these ruined buildings and the street sign. But it was too far away. And I couldn't make it out. And it was all twisted and blackened. And, you know, obviously, I'm referencing the, you know, in my dream, the earthquake. and. Also, the the window I was looking out of happened to be a place I had visited uh, the week before. So it's not like I was having a, a visionary uh, experience or some kind of prophecy, but it was everything that I had been absorbing kind of was informing my dream. And it was such the coolest thing. So when I woke up, I was bummed out <laughs> because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really find <laughs> the, the means of time travel or didn't I? Or did because, you? Yeah. Well, because me, I think I think I did because um, this sounds silly, but when you're around photographs of dead people all the time, you start to and you start researching them and you kind of get to know them and they kind of become your friends a little bit. And I had been delving into the archival material, leather letters, etc., quite heavily for a project I, that I had been working on. And so I got to know these people just through this context, but I got to hear their, you know, through their writing, their humor, you know, certainly their writing style, of course, but it felt like I could actually talk to them in, in certain ways. I, I don't think that sounds weird. 
No, I don't think it sounds weird at all. I think we'd recently uh, done a few projects with our brother Patrick Day out of Colorado, and he has been working on this Greenleaf book forever. And I think he would probably say the same thing. He could probably talk to Greenleaf if he, or I could ask him a question and he would like respond as Greenleaf. I think it would be <laughs> probably uh, something that he could do. I want to ask you about, you had all this this time with these amazing artifacts and the stories and and the people who touched them and the spirit that like kind of gets passed along etherically or philosophically even. I wanted to ask you about the first thing that you wrote about in Freemasonry. Uh, the first thing, I, I can't really remember. I mean, I remember ruminating a lot on the philosophy and its transfer, transformative nature. That's always fun to do. And especially when you become a Mason, you're really enamored by the philosophy and what everybody's written on it and some good, some not so good and some totally wild, but fun nonetheless. And it's interesting to see how Freemasonry has attracted and influenced people. And so I wrote a bit about that. And some of it, I'm sad to say, is not all that good. The one thing, and I, I started to lament because I had friends that were starting to break out into publishing their work. And at that time, I, you know, I had not gone back to graduate school and was not a historian, but interested in history. And, you know, I, I did something, I, I originally started out wanting to be an archaeologist, and then I wanted to go into comparative religion, and then I ended up studying animation. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we all come full circle. But with this caveat, I did a lot of historical stuff and around these stupid little short films I made. And one was based on cave art and was with animated dirt. My professor had done a, a very excellent short film about the Popol Vuh, and which is the the Mayan creation myth. And she spent many years on it. And that kind of gave me a lot of inspiration because I wanted to do documentaries. I wanted to do historically minded films. And one of my fantasies was to uh, do an animated version of Gilgamesh that was based off of a uh, a children's version of it by an illustrated ch children's version of it by Ber Bernarda Bryson. It's sadly out of print, but it's gorgeous. And her art mimicked her own style mixed with Mesopotamian styles. So in any way, I, um, I'd always been interested in history. Fast forward, I have friends in Freemasonry, and it seems like it's a, you know, a topic that people are getting interested in. And in fact, some Masons were like, wow, you know, scholars want to get to know about us. And I had been introduced to a professor at, um, at USF, University of San Francisco, named Tony Fells, who had done a study on the Jewish community in San Francisco. And he used Grand Lodge records to track movements of certain more famous people and maybe not so famous people within that community. And that interested in me because it seemed perfectly logical that you can also, in addition to synagogue records or, or for that matter, any, any house of faith, you can follow people. And it seemed to me because Freemasonry and other fraternal organizations, let's not leave them out, there are hundreds, also have these records and they're a lost history. I mean, they fill in a lot of silences in, in histories. Because they're also, you know, these groups are so, I don't want to say disregarded because that's such a strong term. They're unsung, <laughs> definitely as a, as a primary source. So I was lamenting though, because it seemed like everything had been done and everybody had found all the cool things. And, but here I am surrounded by all of this gorgeous, uh, these gorgeous artifacts. Surely I could do something. And that wasn't simply a show and tell. And well, I found it. And one of the things that I, I would redo it again if I could, but um, I was still proud of it none, nonetheless was I found uh, some archival material. It was in this bound Nilla folder that was said KKK on it. And I thought, wow, okay, that's uh, that can't go ignored. And so I started looking through it and it was several years worth of correspondence from individuals and also from the Grand Lodge that were dealing with the uh, incursion of clan activity in California, which if you've ever studied, I didn't go into it I, with an idea that I would ever study the clan, but if you've ever dealt with anything related to the clan, you'll know that a lot of their, the information is, uh, they, they were really good at secrecy. 
and a lot of what surrounds them was destroyed. Uh, I mean, you know, sadly, but probably for good reason, I suppose, because it is sort of shameful for people to have that sort of stuff. And unfortunately, a lot of that stuff has been destroyed. Well, I found a little cash and I started looking at it and I was, I got some encouragement. You should really delve into that. And so I started to, and I, I sat on it for about a year trying to figure out where I would go with it. And I remember going to the 2007 uh, International Conference on the History of Freemasonry, the ICHF in Edinburgh. That was the first one they did. And I saw a lot of interesting papers and I was determined. I thought it was my punk rock moment where I was like, I could totally do this. It didn't matter that I wasn't an academic, but I felt like I could do this. And I had a subject. And so I went back and I put my nose to the grindstone and I worked on that thing every moment I could. And then I, in the next one that occurred two years later in 2010, I gave my presentation and uh, it was because, you know, you mentioned the clan and it may as well have seven heads and 15 eyes. It will attract attention. And so it was successful in that respect because I had a lot of people more than I, <laughs> more than I expected. And I was standing there talking to people. And this is one of those moments that you are thankful that you didn't react in a different way. I was really tired. I wanted to go and I was really hungry. And there was this gentleman that was standing near me patiently for about 20 minutes as I talked to people who came up to me afterwards. And I almost, or I could have said, well, I've got to go see you later. And I'm so glad I didn't because he ended up mentoring me in this subject. He, he was a professor at Exeter and encouraged me to, I gave him my rough draft of my paper and he said, wow, this needs work. And I said, great, you know, uh, put me to task. I need to learn how to write an academic paper. And I'd spent my life writing and everything. And I was in speech and debate, wrote short stories and everything like that. But writing academically is something completely different. And he really, you know, can, can I improve that paper or papers? It ended up being a trilogy. Yeah, certainly. I'm still learning. Um, but that, that was a pivotal moment for me. And it got published and, and things started to happen after that for me. I dare I say I got some notice and some academics liked the work and encouraged me to do more. And this was in addition to the exhibits I was doing at the Library and Museum. I did quite a number of them and was able to get some other uh, other institutions to lend us uh, items and created these stories. And this really improved not only my storytelling capabilities, but also my ability to keep it factual and interesting. And when people walked away, I was very proud that they may have come in to look at our items or exhibit and thinking, well, you know, my grandfather was a Mason or I'm a Mason from XYZ land. I want to know more. I was proud to say that they walked away with probably more information that they, than they expected to, to obtain. And that was important because in this day and age where we want to let people know who we are, what we do very quickly, and, and there's some importance to that. Uh, I do think that we shouldn't forget that Freemasonry is a very complex organization and that some people are willing to in, indulge that. So anyway, I, I'm going off on tangents. <laughs> no worries. That's what I do all the time. Journey, man. It, it's part of the journey, man. You talked about you know finding this cache of documents that was really kind of like a holy cow aha moment that led you on a path here. Since that time, I'm wondering if just for the sheer interest, was there a time that you researched something that totally blew you away in the midst of the research that either changed your entire outlook or just floored you. Hmm. <laughs> That's a tall order. <laughs> it is, but take as much time as you want because I'll edit. <laughs> well, that whole episode with the, with the clan, that was uh, enlightening because I'm very interested in how people perceive power how they perceive their identities and using other organizations in order to fulfill their desires or to flex their power. Uh, the Klan was very much all of these things. And also Freemasonry is, you know, they're, they're, these guys believed that they were fulfilling 
the obligations they took, not only as Masons, but as Knights Templar, et cetera. These people felt that they were embodying the spirit of knighthood. And uh, it's it's really blows me away because I perceive Freemasonry as being entirely of do-gooders. And, and what I always like is that we do <laughs> It's not, we are, I mean, we have a very positive message and I should, I should, I should add though, that this whole episode of the Klan, at least in California, our Grand Lodge rejected the Klan and said, you can't be a Klansman and a Mason at the same time. It's just not going to be possible. And that was, that was a very great spin I could put on, well, it's not a spin, but it was a great caveat I could put on that because I had some people that spoke to me or wrote to me or put weird things on Facebook, like, what, why would you do something like that? You know, you're, you're besmirching the fraternity, et cetera. It's like, well, actually, I don't have to worry about this because this is the historical record. In that study, I discovered that there had been an issue, not necessarily with the Klan, but similar players that had occurred years earlier regarding the Knights of Columbus and this bogus oath that was being passed around. And so I did a, it was sort of a prequel to the whole clan issue. So these were very enlightening uh, because I'm delving into a social history and a very difficult one at that, uh, you know, where there's definitely going to be have some, definitely going to be some opinions on the matter, but I was always confident because I have primary sources. I mean, this is, this is golden or primary sources that are often difficult to find. The other instances when I was, uh, researching my last big one. Now, I'm not entirely prolific when it comes to writing articles. I mean, I wish I were, and I wish, you know, but I, I've done a lot of exhibits. I've written small things and I've done some pretty intense papers, you know, maybe five or six in total, but they, they took me two or three years each time. So I move pretty slow when it comes to things like this. I sit with it for a while. I have to get to know it. And when I was researching Benjamin Hyam, the scandals and secrets of Benjamin Hyam. I wish it had a better title. That's what I do regret because you may think you're just going to get this, oh, it's California history, gold rush and everything. And, and I'll get to that later on how we interpret certain histories. Sometimes they, they always get sort of, what's a good word for that? A lot of uh, romanticism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's much better. Uh, <laughs> sorry for the purple prose. Um, I found out many things about this brother. And, and so that's why I wish I had a better title because he was involved in the right of Memphis. <laughs> you know, this, this legendary organization that everybody loves to read about. It's got Egypt, it's got, you know, mysticism, et cetera. It's got John Yarker. Yeah. Who, yeah, you know, John yeah. Yarker. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. and then, and then I find out that this tradition has a little bit of California. Although this guy, you know, this this person, Benjamin Hyam, our third grand master, he was an outlier. He was very, very um, one of those different individuals that we, I think, have to celebrate in Freemasonry. You know, we we have these people in our past that are, I like to say, something only the 19th century could have produced and very inquisitive, very uh, hard to deal with, uh, eccentric I will do a shameless plug as you'll have to read it. Um, it's uh, it's in the Freemasons on the Frontier, which was published by Quarter Coronati Lodge. There's more to come out of that. I'd like to, I, I wish I could do a book on him. I'd love to. Um, I, I want to revise the essay because I found out more information, but I sat on this for a long time and I knew about his involvement in the Rite of Memphis for many years before sitting down with it. Um, but when I when I really got into it, I found out Wow. Interesting things. You know, not only his association with Harry Seymour, John Yarker, but also with uh, Confederate spies and all sorts of other interesting activities. So it was, I, I gained a new appreciation for writing biographies and I just absolutely loved it. And that opened up a whole new world to take what was written about a person and what was available in sources such as the proceedings and other secondary sources such as studies on uh he was he was jewish and so i had to study some of the jewish communities in jamaica where he grew up he was actually born in england but emigrated to jamaica and then to california uh this the mexican-american civil war the civil war all of these things kind of smash together and create 
or inform this individual named Benjamin Hyam. And he was there for the beginnings of the California Grand Lodge, extraordinarily controversial. And then I found other things about him that wasn't reported on him. So I pulled that which was lost or really very much uh, unsung and pulled it all together. And from it, you get to really see firsthand this topsy-turvy world and indeed a topsy-turvy world that Freemasonry exists in as a mechanism to create order, but also as, a, as something that people play with <laughs> and create new things out of and interpret differently. So I hope that answered your question. That blows me away. Yeah, I think absolutely. And on a personal note, the right of Memphis very much interests me as well. I did a uh, like a 20-page historical sketch. Oh, I read uh, it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's it was just it's just such a a very bizarre thing the way it happened to have been, and it was interesting to get my hands on some of the as you talked about primary documents. You know, I would go to the Valley of Chicago, and mm-hmm. where they had the uh, you know, yeah, yeah, they had some uh, old minutes and things there. It was just really interesting. One of the things I, I wanted to ask you about, you just mentioned it. You you talked about history and how it's like recorded. And I often think about this history versus, uh, I hate to say versus, but history versus the romanticized myths. And we in Freemasonry, and I say we, I'll just like paint the entire fraternity beige, uh, love our quote unquote romantic history. You know, we could never be wrong. We could never do this. We could never do that. Um, I'm curious to pull that thread a little bit with you, just as a historian and somebody who finds perhaps the extraordinary in the ordinary at times. What are your thoughts on this kind of thing? Well, I think we, I think it's it's rather elementary and base if I say that we all need romanticism. We, but it's true, we do. It helps us get through the day. It gives extra meaning and extracurricular meaning to something and. Indeed, when we, you know, when we were talking about, say, let's pick on the right of Memphis, it's two pronged what I'm going to say. One, it's that we see these rights in Freemasonry and it answers some of our own yearning for romance and the mists of, of, of the ancient world. And look at this is Egyptian Masonry and it might, you know, might be, it might satisfy our confirmation bias or whatever, but it, it creates, a curiosity in us. Now, can that be unhealthy? Most certainly. However, if you are to really look at your own desires, maybe you might find something that you didn't know before and are able to appreciate romance, but also uh, keep your feet on the ground. Now, with the Rite of Memphis and its practitioners, there are many people such as Yarker who really believed that he was, you know, because he was on this quest to find that first estate of ancient mystery schools. And he really loved the Rite of Memphis. But for many, if you look at the records, and I think you mentioned it in your paper, many of these men were SGIGs, 33rds, past grand masters. This was a that that 95th degree, 98th degree was a was a laurel crown on an otherwise, you know, on on an already a successful career. So we have to understand through this romance that people have their own motivations and that Freemasonry is entirely a human construct. It, it represents romance. It re- represents a, our desires to transcend the ordinary world. And so I think I mentioned this the last time we spoke together. I may debunk some of the notions of, of pseudo mysticism in huffing the mists of the past too much. But if Freemasonry is to matter, it actually, you know, it, pr- it promises to transmit unimpaired these benefits that so many of us, uh, so many have, who have come before us, have, have worked with these, these ethics, these ideals. And, and going with that, that if it's the best of humankind and the best of the better angels of our nature, that time doesn't really exist. And so you can use this romance, I mean, some call it LARPing nowadays. I, I, I don't care. Uh, I, I'm interested in drama. 
and psychodrama. I, I think that when you e evoke the past, it doesn't necessarily need to be true. You exist in these ceremonies in a time free where all of the ages exist at once. You know, it's it's you know these all these anachronisms, etc. They don't they don't really translate to the real world. They allow you to absorb what is best in life and what our aspirations are. And so that that would be my best explanation of romance. However, <laughs> you know, we've all encountered these uh, these stories that are way far out. And I'm not just talking about space aliens. I'm just talking about these unattainable spiritual states that are ascribed to Freemasonry. And it's, are we attaching our own desires that are filtered through popular culture that are in turn informed by say the occult revival of the late 19 or the late 19th century or even earlier on in the 18th century i i think so i think there's a lot to be said about that and that's why origin theories are important and that's why examining social and cultural histories you can't go wrong because you will find context you will see that freemasonry doesn't necessarily create anything it actually uh, borrows from other movements other ideas, other philosophies, and as like a exists as a scaffold by which very charismatic people can hang their interests on, right? We've seen this time and time again with the creation of new rights that concentrate on X, Y, Z. I just would caution those who would who would want to just believe it whole cloth. But I would also say, have fun too. Adam, you do so much in Freemasonry. I, I think a lot of people look at Masonry and they go, okay, cool, you know, one night a month. And for the majority of Masons, that that is what it is. And hopefully, in between meetings, they are still being Freemasons, whether, you know, that's philosophically living your life or perhaps, you know, you're involved at some sort of district deputy, you know, level or something. But then I think there are others, folks like yourself, who have all of these awesome talents and interests that are that are outside of Freemasonry as well. But you are one of these kind of 24-7 Masons that I think people go to quite often for a number of things if they want to get something done, if they want to talk to you about you know historical things. Tell me about what are you working on right now? Right now? Well, <laughs> are you sitting down? Um, it's nothing like mind blowing, but I am the executive director of the Oakland Scottish Rite Historical Foundation, which is a 501c3 that was uh, created to assist the Valley of Oakland with restoring and rejuvenating the Oakland Scottish Rite Temple, not only in its physical sense, but to create a culture around its rejuvenation. That this was this temple which if you've never been to it is uh, built in 1927 is a beautiful work of art. It's huge and it's gone through many iterations, but at its core, it's the interior is uh, Italian Renaissance and other classical flourishes. We were talking about the romance and the mists of time. I mean, can you imagine walking into this place when it was first built? It satisfies well, even still, it satisfies everybody's desires and thoughts of what Freemasonry in the Scottish Rite was and is. You walk in and you see an organization that was powerful and believed in beauty and symmetry. And this is what we're trying to do is to not only restore it, but to also have the brothers and the, the community at large appreciate it for the organization it, it houses and the contributions that this organization this valley and this temple has you know has has given to the community it's never been one of those shuttered places it's always had some sort of public face right and so we want to restore that because i think over time we sort of slinked back into slunk back into uh, our own little everyday lives you know if we go to the meetings and we do this and this is our big temple that is beyond our all our capability of keeping track of uh, with its repairs, et cetera, and really awakening that desire again to to really preserve it as a as a monument 
to not only the fraternity, but the community in which it resides. So we've had several fa very famous people belong to this valley and who have walked through these halls. The Valley of Oakland was created in 1883. Uh, this is its fourth meeting place. Uh, the third one is down the street from us, which tells you one thing, obviously, is that it's uh, we owned the entire area. Within 17 years, it was completed in 09, and by 1927, we uh, the old one was completed in 1909, and by 1926, we had broken ground for the new temple. It shows you also a, um, a fraternity that is growing. That's what I work on now, and, it, it, and that includes not only handling how should we uh, address some of the uh, repairs, because some of them have to be done by craftsmen, we're working on right now trying to get a report done that's a historical structures report. So that means collating all of the uh, historical writings and records of this building, which is why you save your records. And if if there's anything that I could say that they did right is that they didn't know what to throw away, so they hoarded everything. So I have a great deal of records on this building, including the original uh, uh, blueprints. We also have about 6,000 volumes in our library. We have not as large as the Grand Lodge, but we have some artifacts. So there's many, many, many different fronts that I have to attack. I'm working with the, the Valley's leadership, of course. And, but, you know, the fraternity being what it is, there's always just a few people doing it. And so we, we are in the business of trying to get the brothers excited and we, we, been fairly successful. We have a very strong knit group of men here that really believe in the valley, just like every other valley. So I'm not I'm not saying that no, nobody else has this um, this drive, but I, I have a particular affinity for Oakland and the Valley of Oakland, and I'm really proud of all our brothers because they were excited to have me come on board and run this foundation, and so I I really tip my hat to them because they recognize the need and also capitalizing on the fact that Freemasonry is perennially attractive, not just to get people to join, because let's face it, we're not going to have lines around the block like the opening of Star Wars or The Empire Strikes Back or something like that, or blockbuster movie. But we do hold an interest for people that are in historical groups, historical preservation societies, and indeed local government, and just anybody who walks by. And each one of them has a connection to the building. Uh, just today, I spoke to a man who finally came in. He's like, yeah, I run around the lake because we're on the banks of Lake Merritt. I run around the lake all the time. And I always run by this place. And today your doors were open and I walked in. Can I have a tour? And he got a tour. You know, so these are local connections. And I take every, it could be the smallest connection. And I, I have to take it seriously because it's part of my job. And so that's what I'm working on right now, and that's a lot, uh, a lot of sleepless nights because I'm doing things that I never thought I'd be doing, running a foundation. I'm mean, a historian, you know, so I have to deal with all sorts of things like taxes and, you know, status. All the, tax, all the know, icky stuff. All the icky stuff. And then I have, you know, all of the other things that I'm, I'm used to doing in libraries and museums. You're also the, you, well, you're the editor of Herodom, correct? But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. <laughs> yes. So I do that during the week and I discovered I can't do anything else during the week because I have all the best intentions when I leave work, sometimes late, of getting home and working for a few hours. I, I am married, so I, you know, I, I want to be married. So <laughs> I have to be a husband, but also I have my other responsibilities. And I decided, well, okay, Herodim. Okay, I work on that on weekends. <laughs> So fortunately, my wife is extraordinarily supportive. She's very sweet that way. And so I sit in my office and I work on Herodom. And that was a, that's a learning curve too, because prior to this, I did some editing work on papers and everything, and also did, um, edited the plumb line, which is the quarterly bulletin for the Scottish Rite Research Society. And that's one paper a quarter, which is daunting enough because if you haven't heard, not many people are writing much anymore on Freemasonry. And uh, I have my own thoughts on this, but you know, we're trying to change that. Digital media is definitely overshadowed print media quite a bit. 
But um, harridom is one of those things that everybody loves to see on their shelves. Whether you read it or not, it's okay. It looks good on your shelf. <laughs> and I love the idea of books as art. So if you don't read your books, that's okay because they look good. Harridom is one of those things, though, that does have an enormous amount of respect, primarily because uh, the Scottish Rite Research Society was started by S. Brent Morris, Dr. S. Brent Morris, who is a... Um, been an incredible mentor to me, and I've known him for a number of years, and never in my wildest dreams would I have ever thought that I would get to do this. And so when I was tapped for it, I said, yes. And like many things, though, that your enthusiasm is large, but then you realize the the the, the realness of it all. And you know what? I couldn't have it any other way. I've definitely improved myself. And this is one of the Things I learned during COVID where I realized, and there's some things we could talk about with this, Freemasonry and, and the performance of Freemasonry or his, the history of Freemasonry with presentations, et cetera, that used to be in person. And then when COVID hit and we were all locked down, the online lectures became extraordinarily popular. Everybody was drinking at the fire hose. And I really enjoyed it and so much that I, I didn't really do many of them because at that time I was trying to figure out, you know, at the time I, I had, I had a change in, in work. I had finished grad school. I became really content with what I was, my work with um, QC Lodge, doing some proofreading with them and then also editing Plumline. I felt that this is my time to really go in inside and I enjoyed that because I finally had something that was me, myself, my own, that I could develop and that other people enjoyed. I didn't really hear about it so much, but I knew that whatever work I put into it, I, I knew somebody would enjoy it. And occasionally I would get emails and it really encouraged me, but I felt like I, I had something that I really could possess and work on and, and improve myself outside of Freemasonry because I've been doing things in Freemasonry for so long. So when I got the uh, the Herodom job, I took that knowledge, but I also realized I don't know InDesign <laughs> half as much as I thought I did. And um, when you say editor of Herodom, you think I'm reading papers and proofreading them, and that's not all editing. I'm working with the authors. I'm helping them develop their papers. Now, the caveat is whatever is sent to me should be a finished paper. However, you know, papers develop over time. And so I work with the with the authors. And what I'm happy with is that during my grad school days, I worked at the university as a graduate writing consultant. And so I use a lot of that training in what I'm doing now. And then, but wait, there's more. I also have to index it. Indexing, for those of you who don't know, is a, a, is a real profession. There are professional indexers. I am not a professional indexer. However, I try my hand at it and it's sufficient, but I'm learning more and more about it. It helps to have Brent as a, as a mentor because he's a mathematician. And so his, he, he thinks very logically, whereas I use indices quite a bit and I appreciate them as a, as a, as a historian, but using them, you know, you kind of gain an appreciation for their structure, et cetera. But when you really get into the bones of it and the marrow and then the cells, Oh, wow. It's a completely different trip and it can be quite frustrating and repetitious and mind numbing. But just like with animation, what I learned, I got into film at an almost cellular level. It's frame by frame. You start to look at movement in a totally different way. And with editing papers, with indexing, that's, it's very similar. I really get into a, a really deep state, a really meditative state. Until I realize I've done something wrong and I have to reconst, you know, I have to redo the index, and that's quite frustrating. But wait, there's more. I uh, I have to get the from the authors and sometimes on my own photographs that go into it, and then I I arrange with the printer all the all the logistics for the printing and distribution, and I get help at the house of the temple. But this is all the stuff that Brent did, and what is really amazing, what I've really enjoyed about it is getting to see getting to know what Brent did under the hood. So when I'm looking at these templates and his interest in, in uh, his interest in typography and how certain letters are changed in a certain way, he's done that and I you know I'm really standing on the shoulders of a giant, but it's really cool to see see that someone's thought process, this 
this product that they've loved so much and, and see how they developed it. And it's a real honor to be able to work with these uh, magical spells, essentially the, the written word and the, and the letters that compose it and how you read it, how your mind receives it, right? But yet you don't really look at the shape of the letter. It's just that your mind finds it pleasurable to read. And then there's the content, of course. And so finding the content and working with the typography, working with the layout, et cetera, et cetera, it's been a real trip. It can be pretty heavy because, you know, there's deadlines, there's so much to do. And so sometimes I don't sleep. <laughs> sometimes I don't, I have to take breaks. I'm one of those people though, that gets into the work and all of a sudden I, I realize I haven't eaten, I haven't stood up in hours. And so, you know, that's been my <laughs> that's been my uh, struggle, but it's it's all for this this journal, which I'm I'm really proud to be a part of. It is a very successful piece of literature, and I think most people that receive it, as you said, looks amazing on the shelf, even if they don't read it. <laughs> but I really enjoyed the way you just spoke about putting together the Herodom volumes because. It is kind of like when you discover a really great paper, there is an art form to sort of laying out how the river is going to flow, right? How this paper is going to take you from boat launch to you know the, the trek and keep you engaged and, and seeing the sights along the way and helping you grab onto the next word. You know, as they would say, you know, I don't know, my dad would say a real page turner. In that sense, on a grander scale for an entire publication. And I think you've done a fantastic job with that. Well, I've only had one volume come out, but time will tell. I mean, sometimes I lament, and I, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm trying to be modest here, but I don't have the, the reputation that, um, that Brent does. And because he's known far and wide as the dean of Masonic education. That's a, you know, I, and I'm not trying to fill his, his shoes, but that, that is a hard act to follow. And so, we have to allow ourselves to create new personalities in the Masonic world and, and, and also assist them in creating a product too. So I hope that within 10 years, I, not that I need notoriety, but that, that, that more people will know that I'm doing it and they like my work and that will send their papers to me because we do always need submissions. But I have a caveat that if someone wants to send a um, paper to Herodom, this is something like you've many people have not ever dealt with before, where it's not necessarily a dissertation that you're writing, but it is academically minded. And so, but I will say that the structure of a paper is not too dissimilar from what everybody, everybody learned in high school. Now you, you can, you, there are more things that I can fill you in later on if you choose to send. But one thing I can suggest if, if there are hopefuls, uh, hopeful authors out there is to read the articles in Herodom because you learn how to write research papers by reading and don't stop with Herodom, read other papers, academic papers, et cetera. What has been published on Freemasonry in an academic sense? This gives you sort of an idea of not only what's been written, uh, so you can you know enlarge your historiographies if you need to include one in your paper, or it, it, but also how they handle the subject matter, the sources they use. Not only that, look at how it is formatted and know that most of the historical world publishes in the Chicago Manual of Style. So look at how it's formatted, how the footnoting is done. Uh, how the how the line spacing is, et cetera. This is how you would want to present your paper in a most basic way, at least with your your citations properly constructed. These are important if you want to write and write well. And I think a lot of us who do this, who write, want to do it well. That it's not a chore; it's something that you want to take on and have it be pleasurable. So. When I critique a paper, it's not that I, you know, I, I always want to, I always talk to the author because you have to hear my voice. An email is way too dry and you may get the wrong, you may think that I'm piling on you about things because it is kind of nitpicky, but you can hear my tone of voice and my, uh, my warm tones of encouragement 
to to really kind of try harder with with certain things and to to, to go deep with it because it is a journey and and it, it again it, it it shouldn't be a slog it should be engaging uh, it should resemble the joy that somebody feels when they read your paper i read some fantastic papers where i'm like god this is so good and some of them are the, are the most simple papers they just say what they mean to say so in that respect you know watch your purple prose you know, if you read Pike too much, do not write like Pike or Mackey. There's a tendency for that. Watch how things are capitalized and punctuated, et cetera, et cetera. And I can walk you through the process, but I encourage everybody to at least try it once, especially if you have information that nobody's ever heard of, right? And to choose a subject that is workable. There are a lot. Well, this of- is this is the question I wanted to ask you about. Like, yeah, if somebody sure. wanted to go out there and they were to say. Hey, I want to write for Herodom or the Plum Line or whatever the, the case might be. For it, it will stick to you know a Masonic topic. For instance, the Illinois Lodge of Research has a caveat about staying clear of dogmatic, yeah. esoteric concepts. Yeah. So, for instance, in the Herodom, you know, it's a publication of the Scottish Rite Research Society, and the Scottish Rite is overwhelmingly an esoteric organization. How does the organization itself square up with perhaps what is published in Herodom? Do you find many esoteric concepts or is it historical or a good mix of both? I say it's a good mix of both. um, And we've been able to do that. I would say that with your content to, we we also have a style sheet that includes what you should use for your style guide, et cetera. And also what subjects you should steer clear of, like what we would call so mode at B subjects where you you just, it's a lot of hyperbole, George Washington and blah, 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 you know, and and a very laudatory uh, language or another, because it is popular, esoteric subjects tend to get way bogged down because the subject matter is vast. And often I find that there's an unfamiliarity with, with with the subject matter. And so I've seen some very good papers and then that that take off bite-sized chunks usually if it's centered around certain degrees or something like that but the the author again has to be broad-minded and well-read when it comes to talks like that there's also a tendency to revert into your own experience and that may not necessarily be that might be valid to you or to those who listen to your talk or whatnot uh, but you would have to have that caveat that this is what you believe as opposed to what is actually there. Uh, you can write stuff like that, but you would have to be intellectually honest and talk about, you know, and and state that. But there there should be some basis in some sort of evidence to suggest that what where you're going with it is is true. And so that means that you have to read a lot. And that's again goes back to my my explanation of you become a better writer by being a, a good reader. And to take your time on it, that I know that there is an there is a uh, an impulse to just want to write on everything and all at once, and that you want to be published and heard, and that that sometimes these subjects take a long, long time to develop, and that's okay, because as you may have seen in normal life, but in Freemasonry, there's people that become very popular, and then in two years you don't hear from them again, and that's because times change, interests wane, and other new ideas pop up. So take your time with it. And if in doubt, have other people read your paper. Uh, Before I get to it as editor, I would say that have other people read it, have them proofread it even, and to really check your sources, to really know that your notion can can be developed into a workable idea. And sometimes it may not, and you have to throw it out. That's fine too. That's part of the process. It's kind of a fudgy thing to ask, I guess, because there's so many variables with it. What you want to make sure is if you say, well, I see this, and, you know, this is definitely Kabbalistic. Well, does it exist only in your rite of Freemasonry or your rituals, or if, does it exist elsewhere? And then if so, what has been said about it? Where are they going with this? How has it developed over time? Find something concrete. Find a find a real thread. Because we are in sort of a labyrinth, and so that Ariadne's thread is absolutely necessary before you turn a wrong corner and face that minotaur. 
That's a terrible metaphor, but <laughs> that's going to be the name of the episode. Uh, we're going to say Adam, Ken- minotaur. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Adam Kendall, uh, Minotaur, finding your, finding your inner Minotaur, finding your inner Minotaur, a terrible, a terrible analogy. So there is uh, an example of something I won't put on paper, <laughs> <laughs> no matter how clever I think it is. Right. <laughs> but also this goes without saying that it may sound good as a presentation, but it doesn't translate well into a paper. So I occasionally have been, you know, I've encountered papers that were look like they were presentations. And so it's a different, it's not that that's bad. It's a different way of writing things down. So to reconstruct your, a presentation does not make a, uh, an essay. Absolutely not. So what you want to do is look at how papers are constructed relearn what you learned in high school and maybe pick up a book or an article about what do they, how do they write academically? Not that I'm saying you must be an academic because that's impossible. I mean, one of the questions I was faced with when I was working at the university was how do I write academically? And I'm like, good question. (laughs) You're asking another graduate student. And there's always this fear of it, but looking at how other people have written in your subject, right? That's the best thing I could, I could do. You know, that's the kindest advice I can give. Read, 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 and really get in deep with it. And I think you've said that before, and I picked it up when we were in Colorado. I actually, you know, I had my notebook that day, and I think I wrote down, it was the first time I had heard somebody say that, and it was, you'll get better at writing the more you read about the things that you want to write about. Mm-hmm. It was really interesting, this idea that, Hey, you know, if I want to be a better academic writer, I need to read more academic papers. It kind of rubs off on you and you see how you should formulate things. And I think there are a number of tools out there that, that do some great things for people too. Like, you know, there are services like Grammarly or whatever that, that are not the be all end all, but certainly will assist you in using proper, you know, nomenclature, you know, making sure you're keeping uh, personal pronouns out of your, your writing and, Absolutely. Things of that nature, yeah. Absolutely. Only the one one thing I have to say is if you're using a, a citation generator, don't. <laughs> because the, if you don't know what you're doing to begin with, you're not going to be able to recognize how it's wrong. And, and I sound harsh when I say that. I'm not really. It's But I can tell because usually what it spits out is a, a bibliographic reference, and which is a little bit different from a footnote citation or a footnote reference. So that's just, there's that's a fun little trick. You could subscribe to the Chicago Manual of Style, which is, I think, essential. However, you can go to Purdue OWL, and which is uh, the online writing lab, and click on their link for uh, Chicago, and look at some of the some of their examples. One thing that I remember to do is to take their example. You could take your example and then paste it on a piece of paper. Or, or excuse me, paste it on your Word document, maybe on a scrap Word document, and then fill in what you need to put in that in that sequence. And then that way you learn by doing it, really. That's the best way to do it, because then it'll just start coming naturally, because nobody is born with this <laughs> at all. I think that goes without saying. Now, it, it, you know, I get mixed up too, because I use two different uh, uh, style guides, yeah, for different publications. So it's, uh, it can get a little bit weird, but Chicago is very logical and, but there's a lot of weird little rules, but they're, it's fun to use because you're, you're really seeing your, your paper come together as a, as a living thing, not just some words on paper. It's, it's designed not to mystify or, you know, destroy your evenings. It's, it's really to really make it the best it can be to put it into a format now, when they when they teach formatting for theses in graduate school, that gets really most of it is on formatting, and it's really intense. It drives people insane. And you know, I felt I felt bad at the Colorado conference because I felt I was being a little bit harsh, laying on some going deep. But you know, I at that time I was getting worked over <laughs> with my with one of my papers. But you know, I I went into it not just with that one paper, but with all of the papers and indeed going back as a, you know, I'm 53 now and I got my graduate degree at 50, you know, as a later student, you know, and it felt like I should have done this a lot sooner considering what I did, but you know, it is what it is. But 
It was the process. It was the process. And I knew, and I remembered something a friend of mine to- told me when I was going in as master to use a Masonic uh, story. He said, you're going to be a different man in a year. And I said, I hope so, but <laughs> you never know how that's going to, but I, I welcome that change. I, I wondered how different this Adam would be. And so with grad school and with everything, I knew that and with every paper I do, I have to sit down and go, okay, I will be a hundred percent different by the end of this. And it, I hope it's good. And it, it usually is. I have, you know, you learn so much. And so thinking of your research as a transformative process that you birth a story, you birth a, and, and, and now history is not just telling stories. You are analyzing something. You, you are really trying to go deep. Don't just put something down as a cool story. Really look at what it what it's saying. What does it mean? And for that, you'll need other sources. You'll need other insights to to bolster your your uh, your assertions. But you definitely are going to come out more knowledgeable. That's for sure. Yeah, I don't think there's been ever really a single time where I dove into something and didn't come out almost like a uh, well, like almost a subject matter expert. I mean, you. When you compile and you do these research projects, if you're truly invested and you truly want to tell a correct account using the correct context, you tend to dive deeper than you normally would say on a 20 minute Wikipedia dive, right? And Mm -hmm. you begin to understand the, well, to use a kind of an odd term, but the socionomics that, that happen in the background of everything that that culminated to lead up to this mathematical thing, this story that ends up happening that has come together. And now you're telling what it, what's happened. And it gives you that great opportunity as well. Like when you go to tell the story or present on the story, or maybe somebody's read the article, I think there's a, there's a pitfall that some guys fall in where what happens is they do the research, they put it out there or they present on it. And then comes the Q&A. And this, uh, in a lot of times, is the test, right? Is this idea that can you hold up? Can you stand your ground knowing the topic during a Q&A session, whether that comes in the form of an email after you've read an article or uh, written an article, rather, or you just stood in front of you know, 30, 40 Lodge Brothers that came out to a special education night and you delivered a topic, right? And I think doing the research in the proper way through all of this assists you immensely in Mm -hmm. in being able to uh, speak intelligently to the topic when questions are asked. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it just takes practice, really. And I think we, uh, I think we all grow up hearing that it just takes practice. Well, it, it really is true. I'm not, you know, trying to smooth anything over and... I, I struggle with this all the time myself to this day, you know, about is it good enough? Can I, can it hold up against scrutiny? You know, now in a Masonic presentation con- context, oftentimes though, we don't get that, those hard questions where you're not defending your, your, your thesis. You know, brothers are usually happy to, to listen and to be enlightened or to have some knowledge dropped. And some of them might approach you later on when they, because it's hard to formulate questions like on the spot. I, I, I hate doing it. I have to mull it over. Right. But that's just, you know, and, and most of the, and, and then also brothers are well-meaning, they not want to tell you what they think. Right. And, but I've had some really good questions uh, posed to me and people that have really like got hooked on something I said, like, 20 minutes before and when, and I kind of go into a trance when I speak. And so I may not remember what I said sometimes, especially after tons of coffee, but it, it, I always try to, I want to be encouraging to brothers listening out there that even if we don't accept the paper and now it's not just me deciding, okay, we, we do have an editorial board. So people read it. And if we decide not to accept it, it doesn't mean that, you know, you're bad or you're a terrible writer or anything like that it just means that it's not acceptable at this time. Um, I usually like to discuss with the author, you know, in person on a phone, usually uh, what could be done to make it better and to try again, because I want to grow 
brother, you know, if brothers have a, have a, have a, an attraction to this, I want to grow that. We don't have a lot of people writing anymore. And indeed how we're taught in school doesn't necessarily uh, portend the type of uh, essay I look for that I was trained in, right? There's different ways people have learned. And so I want brothers to be encouraged to keep on trying because it's not like any of us have have not been rejected and that just is an opportunity to to try harder i i mean i was bummed out a couple at a couple of rejections and they weren't very good rejections either they're just kind of like no and i thought oh gosh i'm never going to do that and so i made it a promise never to do that that you know the author has made it a point to send something they love and they we owe it to them to to discuss it with them I love that much better than some of the critiques, you know, among my favorites were burn it and start over. Um, (laughs) There's not enough authority in your paper. And I had to ask what that even meant. Apparently I did. I didn't, um, I didn't have enough like good citations in, in, you know, areas where other things had been uh, similarly linked or similarly uh, researched. And so I got that one. You know, generally I try to, when I look at papers, I try to find something good about it. Right. And to accentuate that, you know, and it's not, you know, if you can't say something nice, don't say it at all. It it's not, has nothing to do with that. It's really that, you know, there, there are usually kernels of uh, the best in, in a paper and it just needs to be kind of massaged out. And then, you know, but willing to say that, you know, maybe this isn't something you need to be working on right now, you know, that there's some other thing, or you can pivot, you know, that this is too much, you've bitten off too much. Why don't you look at this? Because that is a tendency for everybody, yeah. is to, I, myself included, you have the grandest idea, but it's so big. And, you know, you, you, that's where a, an editor is necessary is to tell you that you've gone, gone too big. Now, I try to be judicious with my time. And so sometimes in production, I can't get to something right away. So patience is required on the part of a, someone submitting, but, you know, patience and the willingness to work with it. Cause if it is that good of an idea, it will stand that test of time. And you'll want to, that's the other thing is you're going to want to sit with this thing when you hate it. Like you are going to be so tired of your paper. <laughs> <laughs> really it's true it's true you almost you almost think to yourself you know um after i publish this damn thing i uh i don't want to see it again i'm yeah. all done yeah yeah so i hope that's enough encouragement for brothers out there because it's really is a lot of fun and there is still so much to talk about in freemasonry and that is the importance of reading because if it's new to you, it may not be new to other people. So you really want to get a a well honed sense of its of Freemasonry's historiography, which is huge and daunting. But when I say historiography, it's basically the history of history. It's it's what has been written on the subject. You know, so you can have an assertion, and you can do an entire paper that's purely history uh, historiographical. You know, this is what's said about it you know, so-and-so said this, so-and-so said this, you can have a thesis statement or an assertion, but you're going to use other people's work. And then you can put in your own, you know, your own ideas, but you're basically using other people's assertions to forward an idea. And sometimes that's necessary. Those are entirely necessary to understand a subject. It doesn't always have to be the grand discovery, but those are, those are hard to do, you know, they, and they have their own peculiar format too. You know, one of the, facets of of the editing process i've i've always i'm starting to struggle with especially with heritum is that i have all these plans for research projects and i'm doing heritum so um but the benefit to this is that i hope when i'm able to and th- this will change over time right i'm not like oh, i'm never going to do anything again it's i have to learn a whole new process and that will play out and then when i'm able to write these i have two papers that i've been dying to do um they will and i uh, i hope i don't die before i'm able to get them out but um i from from what i do with heritum that that will also improve my paper i hope and and if it doesn't please don't write mean things to me um <laughs> <laughs> 
I might have to eat those words, right? But I have some other projects in the works, and it's I I, I will get to travel a little bit this year. I'm finally starting to do a few more uh, presentations. During COVID, obviously, nobody was doing anything, and I I kind of moved away from online. I even got off of Facebook for nearly three years. Say it ain't so. Yeah, but I did start a new one, and it's a professional page. <laughs> so yeah. it's one of those things where I'm just going to post my things, yep. you know, the page of Adam and all of this other stuff I'm not really interested in. But, um, you know, just to promote some of the things I've been doing, but also the history that I love to examine and put that out for people. I mean, that's in conjunction with our Oakland Scottish Rite Historical Foundation's um, uh, website and also its its Facebook page where I'll post exclusive content um, as Ooh. I journey through um, you know finding these these items with my own personal page I'm 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 designing that more of as you get to see me kind of mulling things around so it's going to be infrequent but just interesting things and also you know where I'm going to be speaking etc and where you know if you're interested I'd love to speak more in person because. I'm not. I heard this on your on your podcast a, f- a few episodes ago. You, you guys mentioned uh, the masons that do presentations but don't want to do them online because it takes away from the 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 vibe. And yeah, and, I, and it certainly can, right? I mean, oh God, yeah. I, and I found it awkward, you know. And and I'm I definitely no stranger to public speaking, but doing it in front of a camera was weird. And I felt that first, uh, you know, one of the first times where I did a a talk at a conference and they had it telecast. So way in the back, there's a platform with all these cameras. And I'm like, God, that's really distracting because some unknown force is watching me, right? (laughs) You know, Masonic surveillance. Um, (laughs) So it was weird, but um, I won't say that I I won't do those because, you know, you, I kind of feel like you have to nowadays, but I really like to go and talk in front of lodges and, you really do get a sense of, you know, that that art of oratory that we speak so highly of in our second degree, you know, rhetoric, you know, and part of that part of rhetoric is oratory. And uh, so being able to do that again is something I want to start doing, especially because I want to promote the work that we're doing at the Oakland Scottish Rite Historical Foundation and also Heritum. It, all, all of it kind of is one thing for me, but also that to to inform other brothers that we all have these temples that are falling apart or they're less than they should be, but there is, there are alternatives to, to, to hosing them, <laughs> you know, sure. Uh, if they can be, if they can be saved, you know, that they're, that they, these temples and other artworks for that matter, because these are, you know, this, this building I'm in right now is a museum unto itself. It's a museum of thought, just like my library. It expresses the the ideals of Freemasonry. It says many things about not only what Freemasonry is designed to do, but also what the people at that time believed, right? So when I go into the library, it's a museum of thought because these books on Freemasonry or on esotericism of varying various stripes are what brothers believe the Scottish Rite should be teaching. If it is the University of Freemasonry, that's what I'm about. And uh, I'd love to share more with the brothers. Amazing. Well, everyone out there, if you want to learn more about what Adam is doing and some of the things he's involved with, I will definitely have everything in the show notes and links back to various things that uh, Adam is, again, involved with. I want to thank our guest for coming on and, and really having conversation, just an organic conversation about masonry. And really what I hope a lot of our listeners take away from this is that these sort of projects, whether it's research or some sort of Masonic education, is not outside your grasp. In fact, uh, there are a number of brothers out there willing to assist willing to read your papers, and there are outlets that are ready to publish when you are ready to do that and at that level. And I think, uh, Adam, you have inspired so many people to do this. You know, you've been singing this song about, I think you said it once, um, maybe in a conversation we had recently, even something like publish or perish. Was that you? Yeah. Well, many people have said that. (laughs) I've heard it. (laughs) Okay. I thought it was you who said it. And I think 
what really struck me about this that was that uh, in masonry there are so many opportunities for us to to do this and and really if you want to get super practical about it and you want to say even kind of superficial maybe this is one way that masonry can assist you in becoming a better man in in reading and writing and certainly doing research and things but Adam thank you so much for for sharing your time with us oh thank you very much for having me it was a real Real honor. And uh, yeah, I hope we could do more of this. I know we will. Great. Thank you, my brother. All right. My thanks once more goes out to Brother Adam Kendall for his awesome work, his great opinions, and all of his amazing insights. Again, all of the things that we talked about will be linked in the show notes. So you can check out all of those things and more. We will be sure to have Brother Adam Kendall on ASAP again in the near future. And I have to say, it was an absolute pleasure. Brother Adam and I probably could talk about any number of things for, well, let's just say hours on end. The sun might give out before we finished talking. But I also would like to address that uh, this week I had slated to have Brother Cesar Rubio on the program and I ran into a snag with scheduling. So we will get Brother Cesar Rubio on ASAP, and uh, that is sure to be an excellent episode as well. So once more, I would love to thank our supporters. Again, our contributors, fellows, producers, and legacy partners. If you'd like to learn more about how you can help support this program, Masonic Education, on a weekly basis for anyone interested in this royal art and its kindred sciences, Check out wcypodcast.com, click on support the show, or check out the shop or the bookstore. That's it for this week. Make sure you join us next week. And until then, stay on the level for whence came you. I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.
WCY Media. That's it. Okay, girl.